Surah Al-Falaq and Surah Al-Nas, these two surahs, they are referred to, both of them, they are referred to as Al-Mu'awwidatan. Al-Mu'awwidatan. And that's because both of them begin with this phrase of A'udhu. And we'll talk about what that means, inshallah. So first we'll start with Surah Al-Falaq. Surah Al-Falaq is the first of the two in order. And very quickly, the difference between these two is in Surah Al-Falaq, both of them... Actually, let's comment on A'udhu right now. Mu'awidhatan, because both of them start with A'udhu, and A'udhu means to seek protection and closeness. Seek protection with and closeness to Allah. Seek protection with Allah from Dot, 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 we'll fill in the blank. And seek closeness. Aludhu wa al So these two surahs together are a means of seeking protection from Allah. Seeking protection with Allah from evil, from harm. And the difference between them is in Surah Al Falaq, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the harms and the evils that are external, that are apparent. And in Surah An-Nas, there is discussion of harm and of evil that is hidden. That is not necessarily visible. Or that is internal. And on that note, on that note, you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this dunya with good and with evil. But there is nothing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created that is pure, 100% evil. Nothing of the creation of Allah. Even the worst of creation, Iblis, is not pure evil. And that's something part of our theology. That yes, Allah did create every creation and their actions. خَلَقَكُمْ وَمَا تَعْمَلُونَ Allah created you and what you do. خَيْرِهِ وَشَرِّهِ مِنَ Allah. Good and the evil is both creation of Allah. And the reason for that is this dunya, this worldly life that we are in was never meant to be a rosy, paved, smooth you know, path that has no thorns or no challenges or no problems or no evil or no harm. That's Jannah. But the nature of this limited temporary life that we are in is that there are there are things that are going to we are going to be tested with and some of them are good and some of them are evil and the believer is meant to navigate between this and to seek protection from the evil and to use the good in a way that is pleasing to Allah the believer seeks protection of Allah and stays away from the evil and they use the good in a way that is pleasing to Allah but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't create us in this world, in this realm of existence that has evil in it, that has bad, that has harm, and just let us fend for ourselves. No. But rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us abilities and faculties and agency and tools, physical and most importantly, metaphysical and spiritual, to be able to seek protection. And these two surahs, the Mu'awwidatayn, Al-Falaq and Al-Nas, they serve as a means of protection. We recite, well, we're supposed to be reciting these surahs very often throughout the day. Not just the Mu'awwidatayn, but even all three surahs that inshallah we're, we're discussing today. Al-Ikhlas, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Qul a'udhu bi rabbi al-Falaq, Qul a'udhu bi rabbi nas Can you guys help me really quickly? When are we supposed to recite these? <coughs> I heard morning and evening adhkar. Yes. Anything else? Before going to sleep, the adhkar of a gnome before going to sleep. Good. What else? After each salah. Yes. Anything else? In salah. In salah. Very good. No, really. That's that's very good. 
the Prophet Surah Al-Ikhlas, we didn't mention it, Surah Al-Ikhlas, the Prophet Sallallahu used to love to read it in many different salahs. Amongst them, the Sunnah before Fajr. Um, the two rak'ahs after Tawaf. You read Kafirun and Ikhlas. Uh, the two rak'ahs of Istikhara. He would read Qul Allah Ahad. Uh, in Salatul Maghrib, the Prophet Sallallahu would read Surah Al-Ikhlas. In Witr, the Prophet loved to read Surah Al-Ikhlas in the last rak'ah of night prayer. Uh, so the idea is if you count the number of times that you're supposed to be reciting these surahs as part of the daily devotionals, the adhkar throughout the day, it's more than 10 times. More than 10 times in one day you're reciting these surahs. Guys, it's not a coincidence. Just because we learned something when we were kids or in Sunday school doesn't mean it's going to stick with us for the rest of our lives. We might remember the letters and the sounds. But in order for a meaning to be internalized, it needs to be consistently and constantly and regularly repeated and remembered over and over and over again. How do you memorize a song? <coughs> Stuck on replay. Then you just memorize it. Then you're walking somewhere and you're just uttering, you don't even realize. That's how our brains work. That's how our hearts work. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger by design gave us these surahs to repeat throughout the day because we need protection. We need protection from that which we can see and from a whole lot more that we don't see. One of my teachers used to say, what you don't see is always more than what you do see. pretty obvious, but if you think about it, it manifests in a lot of different ways. So Surah Al-Falaq addresses these dangers, these evils that are external. And so as we're reading Surah Al-Falaq, let us reflect and think about the evils that are external. And as we read Surah Al-Nas, let us reflect and think about the evils that are internal. طيب. Surah Al-Falaq um, again begins with قُل and we mentioned some of the uh, importance of قُل whenever قُل comes in the, in the Qur'an it is coming as a response to a question there are five surahs that begin with قُل <coughs> the brother recited four of them in the beginning what's the fifth? Surah Al-Jinn قُلْ وَحُيَا إِلَيَّ أَنَّهُ اسْتَمَعَ نَفَرٌ مِنَ الْجِنِّ you want to stump a half of make them read Surah Al-Jinn Nobody's going to get that one right. No, mashallah, maybe some people will. <laughs> Don't ask me to. طيب, قل. Another value of قُل that I will add, in addition to what we said, is قُل here shows us the importance of the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How so? Yes, ma'am. You have your hand up over there? No? I just... How does قُل How does this command verb Allah is saying to Muhammad say How does this show us the value of the Messenger of Muhammad Yes sir Because it's Allah telling us directly and trusts his Prophet to tell us this important message Good Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is delivering this message to us through the medium of Muhammad meaning he is the teacher he is the mu'allim, he is the instructor, he is the one coming with this message. And that shows us the importance of the Prophet ﷺ as a teacher. And we need to absorb and trust and accept and take from the Messenger of Allah whatever he said. This is actually a really important point. Because nowadays a lot of people treat the Messenger Hasha, may Allah guide us and protect us. A lot of people treat the Messenger like a, like a postal carrier. Just dropped off a message and move on. But that's not the case. Not only did Rasulullah deliver to us wahi, the revelation, the Qur'an, but he also lived it and taught it to us. And that's why it is impossible, emphatically, to understand the Qur'an and to live it and to implement it devoid of the example of Rasulullah Sallallahu You cannot separate between the two. To separate between the two is making up another religion. That's not Islam. So Qul shows us the importance and the value of the Messenger as an instructor, as a teacher. 
to deliver and express and show and teach this message. Say to them, O oh Muhammad, such and such. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ So we said, أَعُوذُ, we know what it means. أَعُوذُ أَلْتَجِئُ أَلُوذُ وَأَلْتَجِئُ I seek protection, I seek closeness to Allah. Who? بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ قُلْ أَعُوذُ I am seeking protection and closeness to who? To the Rabb of Al-Falaq. And here we have this name of Allah, Rabb. Rabb. And Rabb is used here because it is very relevant to the meanings that we are going to derive from this surah, the surah, the implication of, of this surah. Rabb in Arabic refers to the owner. And even the English equivalent is used the same way. So in English we say, Lord. And so when you have a, a piece of real estate, the one who is in charge of that real estate is the landlord. In Arabic they used to say, Rabbul Bayt, Rabbul Dar. Right? The Rabb of this household. They didn't mean it to, to refer to a deity or, or uh, uh, someone to be worshipped, but they're using Rabb in the linguistic term. The Rabb of this household. The Rabb of this room. The Rabb of this convention center. Right? Someone who is the landlord. Someone who is in charge of the affairs. That's what it means linguistically. But there are so many implications. Of those implications is, you know, have we heard this word, tarbiya? Tarbiya? What does tarbiya mean? Can anyone enlighten us? Yes. Develop. To develop. Good, I like that. That's a very good uh, translation. Tarbiya. To develop. Often we use it when we talk about parents raising their children. Yurabbi. To raise this child. What do you do? All you do is just give them food and water? That's it? And change their diapers? No. You've got to teach this child. You've got to protect this child. A parent that does not protect their child is not doing tarbiyah. You've got to protect. You've got to watch over. So it's not just a matter of feeding and allowing them to stay alive and that's it. I am the Rabb. No. So there is creation. Khaliq. There is sustaining that creation. Raziq. And there is also protecting that creation. That's part of tarbiyah. That's part of Rabb. Protection. And so when we seek protection with Allah, we use this name, Rabb. And when you make dua, Ya Rabbi. Because, oh Allah, you created me, you sustain me, you nourish me, you watch over me, you've protected me. I need your mercy. I need your guidance. I need your assistance. You are in need of your murabbi, of the one that develops and protects and takes care of you. Birab al-falaq. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to describe himself as the Lord, the Rabb of al-falaq. Very interesting choice of words. No word in the Quran is there just to fill a spot, just to, to complete a word count. Oh, we need to get, no. Every word is by des divine design. What is al-falaq? There are many uh, 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 interpretations of the ulama, of what falaq refers to, but the vast majority, they said, sunrise. When the sun cracks the line of, of, of the horizon and the darkness, and light basically shines through the, the, the sky. That is called falaq. Right? And falaq literally means when something cracks or breaks open. Because the light, if you've ever watched sunrise, if you watch the sunrise, that light is coming and it pierces through that darkness and cracks it open. And it's beautiful. Why sunrise? Why morning? The ulama, they said something beautiful. They said, the way that the human being is surrounded by so many evils and dangers, likewise, it's as if they are engulfed in darkness. And how do you get rid of that darkness? One of my teachers, he used to always say, 
May Allah preserve him. He used to always say, Al-Islam, Noor. Wal-Kufr, Zalam. Fa'idha ja'a Noor, Zahab al-Zalam. He used to say, Islam is light. And disbelief is darkness. When you turn the light on, the room ceases to be dark. So they said, just like the human being is engulfed in darkness, and then the light comes through and removes that darkness just as soon as the light appears, there's no more darkness. You can't have light and dark at the same time. The room is either dark or it's light. Or there's some light. That reminds me of a, a little tale. Do we have time for a little story? Yes? Okay. You guys know about the three, the three sons? That the father, the father tested these three sons who was going to inherit his wealth. You guys know that story? No? You don't know that story? Seriously? Okay. Listen up. So this father, he has three sons, right? And he tells them, I'm going to test you guys. And whoever passes the test is going to inherit all of my wealth and my assets. So they said, okay. So he took them into the barn room. No? And he said, whoever can use whatever they have to fill up this room, you will pass the test. So the first son is like, I got it. He was skilled at, you know, he used to always do the chore of chopping the timber. So he goes and he chops and he chops and he chops and he gets all this wood and until he's exhausted, he gathers every last penny he has and he goes and buys chopped wood and he loads it on a... Uh, you know, in a crate and rolls it into the barn and fills it up and it fills and it fills, but there's still space at the top. <clears throat> Father says, no pass. So the second guy comes and he says, hmm, I should learn from my other brother. That wasn't a real smart move what he did. You know, wood is heavy and takes time. I'll get hay. We've got tons of hay lying around. Are you kidding me? I can fill this thing from roof to, from uh, floor to ceiling in hay. So he gets every possible bushel of hay that he can find. And he fills and fills and fills until there's no more hairy hay left. And there's still some room at the top. And the father says, <clears throat> no pass. And then the third son comes and he says, hmm. And he gets a candle and a match. And he lights the candle. And he filled the room with light. And the father said, you win. End of story. <laughs> you guys were expecting something really exciting, right? <laughs> the moral of the story is <laughs> that when light comes, darkness ceases to exist. Okay? You guys get the point. So, al-falaq. We're talking about being surrounded by evil, so the light comes. So Allah used the Rabb, the one who uh, uh, causes the sun to rise every single morning. Uh, that's from the, the, the uh, affairs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. كُلَّ يَوْمٍ هُوَ فِي شَأْنٍ Every day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is directly involved in the affairs of His creation. Uh, there is this uh, 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 false theological belief that God created the creation and just set them in a motion and let it be. That we don't have that in Islam. In Surah Al-Rahman, Allah said, "Kulla yawmin huwa fi sha'n." Every single day, Allah is directly involved in the affairs of the creation. Sunrise, sunset, rain, clouds, heat, sun, wind, everything that happens, Allah is directly involved and aware. وَمَا تَسْقُطُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ إِلَّا يَعْلَمُهَا Not a single leaf falls from any tree, anywhere, except that it falls by the permission with the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. طيب. So, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ We're seeking protection and closeness uh, uh, to Allah, who is the Lord of daybreak. The light, the light from the sunrise. What are we seeking protection from? قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ مِنْ فَرَمْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقْ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقْ From any evil that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created. And we said, we affirm and we believe that Allah created good and evil. Good and bad. But nothing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created is 100% pure, complete evil with no goodness that could come out of it one way or another. 
So this is a comprehensive uh, verse. The ulama asked a question. They said, is comprehensive. It includes every evil and bad thing. So then why is Allah going to more details later on? And then in Surah An-Nas, they said, because Misharima Khalaq includes all of the evils that is going to be mentioned later, you know, forthcoming. But those evils, specific evils, are mentioned specifically because of how dangerous they are. Misharima Khalaq. Now, Misharima Khalaq includes, includes ourselves. We are part of what Allah khalaq. Yes or no? So if we're saying from the evil of everything that Allah created, we're part of that. Is there evil within us? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. That's why in the beginning of Jumu'ah, and also in the beginning of a nikah, they have khutbatun nikah. إِنَّ الْحَمْدَ لِلَّهِ نَحْمَدُهُ وَنَسْتَعِينُهُ وَنَسْتَغْفِرُهُ وَنَسْتَهْدِي All praise and gratitude belongs to Allah. We praise Him, we thank Him, we seek guidance, we seek His assistance, forgiveness. Right? We've heard this before. وَنَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ شُرُورِ أَنفُسِنَا وَمِنْ سَيِّئَاتِ أَعْمَالِنَا Next time the khutbah starts and you're like, no, hold on. We seek refuge in Allah مِنْ شُرُورِ أَنفُسِنَا From the evil within us. وَمِنْ سَيِّئَاتِ أَعْمَالِنَا And from the evil consequences of our actions. Is there evil within us? Yes, there is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us as beings that have intellect, that can process information, can process revelation, can discern and distinguish right from wrong and Allah placed within us the potential to do good or to do bad. You can do bad if you want. You could do a lot of evil. You have the faculties to do so. You're not supposed to. You shouldn't. You'll be held accountable if you do. But you can. And that propensity, that potential the, 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 a lot of traits that are within the human being, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put it in there, in us, as a test, so that we live this life to combat that potential. A lot of the, what we call diseases of the heart, that stems from a potential to want to do something evil. You've got to fight that. That's part of, what, that's part of the wisdom of our creation. To fight some of those magnetic reactions that we have in ourselves to that which is unhealthy, unethical, impure. You've got to resist that. Otherwise, if we just give in, we will be lower than animals. In whom illa kal an'ami, bal hum adal. They are like livestock. Actually, no, they're lower than livestock. Because livestock, they eat, sleep, and poop, and that's what they were created to do. But you and I were not created to eat, sleep, and poop. مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقْ و and also مِنْ شَرِّ غَاسِقٍ إِذَا وَقَبْ and also from the evil of غَاسِقٍ إِذَا وَقَبْ what is غَاسِقٍ إِذَا وَقَبْ the majority of ulama they said غَاسِقٍ here refers to the darkness of nightfall why are we seeking refuge in Allah from the evil of when the darkness of nightfall overcomes and overtakes and the darkness engulfs and envelops everyone and everything? Why is that something to seek refuge in Allah from the evil of it? Why? You know, subhanAllah, something very interesting. Think about this. Most sinful and evil actions that human beings do they do it at night. Anybody ever notice that? Not always, but oftentimes, most of the time, lewd, inappropriate, unethical, unhealthy, sinful, criminal behavior takes place at night. That's interesting. And people that are evil, people that are criminals, they love to do their work at night. They always choose night. 
But there's something interesting about that. Also, a lot of harmful creatures come and uh, are active at night. Anybody ever go camping? Or backpacking? You should come over to California. We got some great backpacking places. Um, you see snakes and scorpions and a lot of harmful creatures that come out to play at night. There's something about that. The shayateen, the devils, they like to come out at night. That's why the Prophet wasallam he encouraged us to protect our children at night time. Now some parents, they uh, get a little excited about that and it becomes like law, like you can never do anything after Maghrib. Hold on one second. You know, yes, it is encouraged that we retreat back to our homes and the masajid and the dwellings and the places at nighttime. We shouldn't just be out and about playing. But if somebody is, uh, you know, in a safe environment or with a group or under proper supervision, then it is not haram. This is an encouragement. It shouldn't become habitual that the kids are just always playing out at night. That's not healthy. Nor is it safe. I think everyone would agree with that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, teaches us here to seek refuge from the evil. All of these evil things. Because a lot of evil happens at nighttime. And that potential, that magnetic reaction that we talked about, it seems to get intensified in the human being at nighttime. Because at night, there is a little bit more free time. Like, mm, now what do I do? Oh, I can do this. Uh, right? So that, that propensity increases at nighttime. That's why, that's why the acts of ibadah at nighttime are so much more valuable. Because the fight is stronger. And the need to resist is intensified. That's why Qiyamul Layl is so valuable. That's why making dua in the last hour of the night is guaranteed to be answered by Allah. Because that's a time when the devils come out to play. The jinn devils and the human devils. And if the believer can restrain themselves at that time when everyone is out partying and acting a fool and the believer stays in a position of worship, man. It's one thing to stop yourself from acting a criminal fool. It's another thing to take it a step further and be in ibadah to Allah. Allahu Akbar. And that's why the reward is multiplied as well. Al-ajr ala qadri al-mashaqqa. Reward is multiplied when effort has to be increased. ومن شر غاسق إذا وقب. I will mention to you a hadith that uh, was a little um, confusing for some people, and it's almost time for us to transition. Uh, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was sitting with Aisha, okay, and it was night time, and it was the, the moon was out, and so the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he pointed with his finger, and he said, "Seek refuge from this." And he pointed with his finger in the direction of the moon. And he said, Seek refuge from this ghasiqin idha waqab. So some people said that ghasiqin idha waqab is the moon when it comes out and is apparent. But what is the evil of the moon? So the ulama, they said, No. The meaning is not the moon, but the Prophet ﷺ pointed to it because the moon only comes out at night. It's clearly associated with nighttime. So what the Prophet was referring to was night. You know, sometimes you refer to a part to refer you, 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 you use a part to refer to a whole, right? Like in an analogy. So the Prophet ﷺ was pointing, and the, the meaning is not the evil of the moon, but the meaning is nighttime. And night, one of the aspects of night is the moon comes out at night. So غَاسِقِينَ إِذَا وَقَبْ The night when it's darkness overcomes. وَمِنْ شَرِّ النَّفَّاثَاتِ فِي الْعُقَدِ And from the evil of those that blow in knots. نَفَّاثَات The ulama said here, it's in, linguistically, it's in the feminine form. So they said, is it referring to females or is it referring to nafs? The anfus that does blowing. That soul, that individual that does blowing. The ulama have different opinions. Some of them said it is specifically the female sorcerers. Why? They said the meaning of this verse um, applies to male sorcerers and magicians who do acts of sorcery. But they said that the evil that came from the female sorcerers was more intense. 
Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he said it's in the feminine form because it refers to nafs. And nafs is, in the plural, emphasis, use, use a feminine linguistic form to refer to it. So he said it applies to any nafs that blows. And this was the choice of the majority of scholars of tafsir. Who's blowing? What is nafs? Nafs is to blow without spitting, without saliva. So you blow, and there is some moisture, but it is not like a spit. A spit in Arabic, we call it tafil. tafil. And if there is blowing without any moisture, it's called nafkh. But when you do, that's called uh, uh, um, nafth. And this is an action that sorcerers and magicians used to do when they wanted to afflict evil upon other people. They would take certain possessions of theirs, they would tie them into knots, they would do some sorcery and some magic, and they would blow into it. And oftentimes, uh, there would be associated with this as well, evil collaboration with the shayateen and with the jinn. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us. So this is an evil action. And it affects people and it harms people. So we seek refuge in Allah from that evil and from that harm. وَمِن شَرِّ حَاسِدٍ إِذَا حسد. And this is the last one that is mentioned. And it is one of the most evil. From the evil of the hasid, the one who does hasad, envy. إِذَا حسد. When they cast their hasad. Hasad is not like just jealousy. But the definition of hasad is tamanni zawalun ni'mah. That not only is a person jealous of what someone else has, sakallahu khairan, thank you, but they are also wishing for that person to lose access to that which they have. And that is very evil. But notice here that Allah said hasidin idha hasad. The evil of the hasid when they cast their hasid. Why? Because the ulama said, again, we have a potential, we have a propensity to move towards hasid. Thank you. To move towards hasid. But if a person dwells on it, then that's when they become hasid. That's when they are casting that hasid. Because someone might get a fleeting thought. Man, why do they have to... But you have to quickly overcome and pass it. Don't dwell on it. And it's from the mercy of Allah that He didn't stop and He didn't say, hasidin." period. Because then we would have been all messed up. Because which one of us is not affected by these fleeting thoughts from time to time? This is something that comes upon the hearts and minds. But again, you've got to resist. You've got to fight the evil. Whether it's outside of you or within you. And so to dwell on that thought, and then even worse, to take certain actions. So some people actually start taking actions to fulfill their hasad, to remove that blessing that that person has. And that's the epitome of evil. We seek refuge in Allah. We seek protection in Allah from that hasad. One of the ways quickly to combat hasad, if you get these feelings, if you notice that you have this feeling about someone, man, why? Man and it's biting and gnawing at you, immediately what you do is you make dua for that person to have barakah in what they have been given. And if you want it to, make dua, Allah, make dua to Allah to grant it to you as well. But what difference is it going to make for you if they lose it? Some people are competitive. They want to be unique. They want to have it and nobody else, they don't want anyone else. If that's fine, ask Allah for better than what they have. But let them keep it, man. Who will keep it? Somebody has something that you really want. May Allah put barakah in, in what they have. May Allah grant me better. Why do you gotta set yourself, cut yourself short and only want that? You can get a lot more. So ask Allah for barakah and what that person has. Make dua for them. And you will notice that making dua for someone extinguishes ill feelings. Because the two can't, you can't hate someone and, oh Allah, forgive them. You can't do it. It just doesn't work. You know? So one's got to beat the other. So resist. You see someone that you have these feelings to? Oh Allah, forgive them. Oh Allah, grant them the best of this life and the best of the hereafter. 
O oh Allah, grant me the best of what you have granted them and even better, O oh Allah. O oh Allah, you are not limited. O oh Allah, your bounties and your gifts are not limited by any limitation. O oh Allah, grant me the best of this life and the best of the hereafter. Grant me the best of whatever the Messenger of Allah asked for. Why well, you gotta sell yourself short? So hasad is not only evil, but it's also selling yourself short. وَمِنْ شَرِّ حَاسِدٍ إِذَا حسد. Notice that here we sought refuge in one attribute of Allah from how many things? قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ One attribute of Allah مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقْ وَمِنْ شَرِّ غَاسِقٍ إِذَا وَقَبْ وَمِنْ شَرِّ النَّفَّاثَاتِ فِي الْعُقَدْ وَمِنْ شَرِّ حَاسِدٍ إِذَا حسد. We mentioned everything and three things in particular. 